Welcome to our webinar on digital automation intelligence. Today we have two very interesting speakers, Dr. John Bates, who's going to be giving us a presentation on three ways that TestPlan is disrupting testing today. And thereafter, Dr. Gary Smith, who's going to give us a demonstration digital automation intelligence suite. During the course of the webinar, you can ask questions using the chat window on the right-hand side, and we'll do our very best to answer as many of those questions as possible during the course of the webinar. Now, over to Dr. Bates. Today, I'm going to talk about three ways in which we're disrupting testing through digital automation intelligence. Our number one, user experience test automation. The idea here is that through, by testing through the eyes of the user, we can delight customers and increase revenues. Secondly, using artificial intelligence driven test creation to automate the process of not just executing tests, but creating tests and analyzing the results. And this allows you to accelerate your time to market, improve your test coverage, and lower your costs. And thirdly, using predictive analytics to analyze the launch readiness of your application or system to de-risk the business outcomes. Let's have a look at these in more detail. First of all, user experience test automation. Well, if you look at what's changed in testing over the last 20 years, or even as recently as the last few years, testing used to be about does the code work? Have you gone through a compliance process to test that the most common functions actually work? Well, the world's changed. Now, whether an application is successful is measured in does it delight its users? Does it get five stars in the app store? Does it have a high net promoter score? And does it minimize user churn? In other words, is it successful? from a business point of view in capturing new users and capturing their imagination. So really, this concept of UX or user experience often equates to that getting the five stars in the app star and user success. And this doesn't just go for business to consumer applications, B2C, it also goes for business to business, B2B type applications. However, there's what you might call a user experience gap between the reality and the desired outcome. If you look at results from 750 companies in the US and Europe in spaces such as retail, financial services, and telecommunications, 86% of the test teams building products in these companies feel their teams are meeting their test objectives. However, if you talk to their customers, only 18% are actually meeting customer expectations. If you look also at data from Apple and Google in their app stores, only 4% of applications in the B2C and B2B world are actually still used one month after being downloaded. That really shows that you have to capture the imagination of your users pretty early on and capture their user delight. You know, if you look at software, it's really changed in architecture over the last few years. Whereas software used to be about testing the code in a monolithic architecture, it's really now largely a layer of business logic that might call out to microservices in the cloud and in an Internet of Things world to microservices at the edge of the network. So we've now not just got mobile devices at the front end, we've got sensors and other connected devices at the back end with the cloud in the middle and a range of mobile devices um, that the application has to be rendered on. This world is what you might call the digital experience. So it's bringing together web, mobile, internet of things, cloud, to be able to deliver a digital experience to customers. If you combine that with the fact this is a DevOps world, a world of agile development with very rapid development cycles, um, then that combines in the complexity in that you just don't have much time to do extremely complex monitoring. And if you think about this world where 
um, you've got this layer of business logic that's calling out to microservices in the cloud. You don't even own the code largely anymore. So how can you actually test the code as if you own it? You need to test this through the eyes of the user as if a user was actually using the application. You need to be able to test on a range of mobile and IoT devices, and you need to be able to test microservices and APIs at the back end. So this idea about um, user experience, it's more than just does the code work, it's about does it delight the user? Here's a screenshot from HSBC's application, bank, uh, mobile banking application. If you don't type in a user name and password and press OK, you end up with a blank screen and no way of adjusting anything. What a horrible user experience. It may not be terminal, but it'll certainly put you off the bank. But moving on to more serious systems, let's talk about NASA, one of Test Plant's customers that we're helping. And this is the Orion space vehicle whose mission is to reach Mars with a um, humans on board, um, a, a, an actual human mission to Mars, and then to return safely. It's the first space vehicle that has what they call a glass cockpit, an all digital user experience. Previously, space vehicles have taken paper manuals out with them. The paper manuals um, cost weight, and weight is um, an expense in space travel you'd like to be able to avoid. So for the first time, you've got a microservices, a digital communication based architecture in which redundant systems are interconnected, talking to mission control through communications channels, talking to sensors outside the vehicle, inside the sensors, space sensors, and all bringing everything together in the user experience. Now, you want to make sure that the right information appears in the right place at the right time and corresponds with the data being sent to those back um, end services. Otherwise, lives can be lost and an expensive mission can um, be affected. So it's absolutely critical, whether it means delighting your customers or completing your mission, that you are able to test the user experience as a user would actually see it. And uniquely, the first way in which test plants disrupting testing is by delivering user experience testing through the eyes of the user. Firstly, through our, our eggplant range of products, our eggplant functional product, which allows you to connect to any device, any application, and indeed any API, so you can um, correspond and correlate API um, activity across what's happening in the user interface and take control of that application as if the user is using it. So you can click on the screen, you can select things, you can actually read and understand what's appearing on the screen in terms of text and graphics and image searching. And you can run through a user journey in the same way a user would. Um, you can do this in a technology agnostic way. So it works on any platform. It's non-invasive, so you don't need access to the code. So it works great in spaces where there's top secrecy involved and the defense industry. Um, you can use those applications end to end. You can synchronize the use of APIs with the front end. And then you can scale it up using our eggplant performance product so that it's not just one user using it, it's a range of different users with different personalities differing, testing in parallel different characteristics of the system, combining functional user experience testing with load and performance testing. Okay, so that was user experience test automation. And the idea is that you delight your customers and increase your revenue um, in doing so. Second area we're going to talk about in disruption is artificial intelligence driven test creation automation. In other words, using AI to automatically create tests for you. And that's all about accelerating your time to market so you get this disruption in the market before your competitors. You have a much better quality product and you lower costs because you need less human intervention. Very commonly in development cycles is the concept of continuous delivery. You may use terms like agile, DevOps, um, and CD. And this is all about developing, building, testing, deploying, and releasing in a very agile and rapid way. So you iterate and learn from your customers and bring out the next version of your product rapidly. 
Now, the problem here is there just is becoming less and less time in each release cycle. And if you look at another of my gap analyses, the productivity gap, you'll see going back to those 750 companies in the enterprise software space, 30% um, in most companies on average is spent on QA of the overall IT budget. However, 89% of those teams say they can't keep up. And 81% are saying, if we had more time, we'd be able to um, do more better work and we'd be able to have a better impact on the business in our applications. However, you're not gonna get more time. You're gonna get less time. The time's ever decreasing. So you need to do more automation still a large amount of testing is done manually and um, if you look at another of my gaps the automation gap 56 percent um, of organizations say they can't use test automation for a significant part of their testing so we need to increase the level of automation we need to do more testing in less time and that's not going to get easier that's just going to get harder so how can we do that well, firstly, thinking about test automation, it's typically focused on only one part of the testing cycle. Here we can see the testing cycle ranging from defining test objectives, defining test cases, creating the scripts, setting up the environment, then executing the tests, reviewing the test results, taking that feedback and then refining those tests. The only part shown here in purple that's really automated is the execution of those test scripts. So people manually write scripts typically, or maybe use a graphical tool to create those scripts where they have to de develop that. Then they have to be run automatically, and then the results manually are analyzed. What Test Plant's doing is turning that whole cycle purple. Add through AI and analytics and big data, we are um, uh, automating the process of more and more. Um, uh, of, of, of automation in that cycle. And how are we doing that? Well, let's look at some of the data, first of all, that our system takes in. We've created a product called Eggplant AI, which is part of our digital automation intelligence suite. Works seamlessly with our functional and performance products I talked about earlier. So the idea here is you're taking things in. First of all, test teams have to know that they can test their prioritized test cases, the things that in their specifications um, as part of their you know, testing process, they have to make sure they've tested these user journeys, these paths. And also maybe from analyzing their user logs um, and seeing which are common user journeys, they probably want to make sure they've tested those as well because they're common happy paths. However, also they probably want to take in um, you know, and analyze in the past, based on releases that look like this, um, have these releases resulted in an increase or a decrease in customer satisfaction? And from that, we can probably glean the impact this release is going to have um, on customer satisfaction um, or what we need to do to improve customer satisfaction. Furthermore, we probably want to know which modules the code changed the most in and even what developers worked on those modules because maybe those developers have a historical pattern of putting the same kind of bugs in. Um, so those are some of the things we want to take in. Now, what our AI product does is it makes sure you test the common use cases and the prioritized test cases and the common user journeys, but also it explores permutations you haven't thought of around those and the idea is most test automation doesn't find bugs it just automates regressions finding um, repeating um, the the finding of bugs that manual testers for example have already found this product actually finds bugs it explores user journeys around things but it also explores unexpected user journeys such as the one of pressing ok before a username and password has been entered. And the idea there is it's maximizing coverage, it's doing things a human might not think of doing. Um, and it also will prioritize things like code that's churned, code that's changed the most. And even will look for common bugs that a particular developer often puts in there. And furthermore, and we'll get onto this a little bit more in a second, it's about analyzing the impact 
of this particular release and the amount of code change, for example, on customer satisfaction. So that's Eggplant AI, analyzing, automatically creating the test scripts and then automatically analyzing the results and feeding back. So that was AI driven test creation. And then final area in which we're disrupting testing is predictive analytics for launch readiness. And the idea here is that we can see what impact this release is going to have on the business and ideally de-risking any issues um, before we do the release. So here I'm introducing another of my gaps. This is the confidence and predictability gap. There's a big gap really still in business between the development team, the testing team and the business. So if you're the head of digital banking at a bank, for example, probably you're um, responsible for releasing the latest version of your digital banking product. But yet you're not building it and you're not testing it. Wouldn't it be nice if you had some visibility and some confidence about just how good that testing is, just how good this release is going to be? Is there going to be a catastrophic failure? What's the chances of that happening? Is there going to be an improvement in the net promoter score? Is there going to be good reviews in the app store and so on? So the idea here is the testing cycle and our digital automation intelligence process we've talked about it collects a lot of technical metrics, but can you turn those technical metrics into predictive analytics to improve the business outcomes by predicting key launch metrics? Can you predict, um, for example, if you made these changes, you could increase your revenue by a million dollars a week? Um, the, can you predict that this launch, if you put it live now, would get five stars in the App Store? Can you predict that? Um, this there's too much code churn in this release um, for us to be able to automatically improve the coverage to guarantee that it will increase user satisfaction. You probably should break this into two releases and so on. This is the kind of thing that we are delivering through our um, test plant eggplant analytics capabilities. So if you look at all of these things together, our trajectory is moving to smart testing as a service. Imagine a big red button that you press and that takes care of your testing. We put your build into our eggplant automation cloud, which is connected to a whole range of different devices, mobile and fixed, and that can timeshare across those devices and make virtualize them and make maximum use of them across a load of automated tests. This is connected to um, a continuous development environment um, of all your tools that you might use in the open source testing world, your Jenkins continuous integration, and so on. It's also, of course, connected to our digital automation intelligence suite, our user experience for eggplant functional and eggplant performance, our eggplant AI capability to automatically generate your test cases. And we're also building a number of vertical test solutions with pre-populated models for particular common use cases across different industries. And then our eggplant analytics capability is predicting your business outcomes. And the idea here is to maximize your profitability, your quality, your reliability, and to reduce your cost. The idea here is not to replace human beings, but to maximize their potential. It's to enable, for example, an automation engineer who may not be a programmer, um, but understands testing to be able to um, be the coordinator of a, a whole lot of AI algorithms that can generate automatically test scripts from a scriptless uh, modeling capability, and then automatically run those against a wide range of devices in a highly scalable way, test usability, user experience, functionality, performance, quality against your development environment, uh, and then predict the business outcomes of that release, as well as refining the test cases to maximize your coverage and quality. So in summary, TestPlant's digital automation intelligence suite is delivering User experience test automation, testing through the eye of the user as a user would use the application to delight customers and to increase revenues. It's delivering artificial intelligence driven test creation 
to accelerate time to market, improve coverage and lower costs, and predictive analytics to detect whether an application is ready for launch and to de-risk business outcomes. Back to my colleague. John, thanks so much. Now I'm going to go over to Gareth for a demonstration. My name is Gareth Smith. We will cover the steps to build and run an eggplant AI model. We'll start off by building a simple model that defines a rating application. First of all, in our initial state, we will launch the application. Then we'll move into the next state, which will be our login screen. Within the login screen, the user can set their username, they can set their password, and then we can click OK to log into the rating application. So I simply create the three actions I need within this screen. Next, we select the launch app action within the initial state and we link that to the login screen. So when the launch app action is run, the next stage is to look at all the different actions within the login screen. Now we create the actual rating screen itself. This is where I'm going to set the rating. So I define a state called set rating and I have a, an action in here called the rating button. So this defines the behavior that the user will select to define the rating. Again, like the launch app, I select the OK and I point that to the rating button. So when the user clicks OK, they go to the rating button. The final transition I make here is from the rating button to the exit state. The exit state is not shown as an explicit state, so we see a small pop under icon rather than explicit arrow. Next, I can create actions within the actual canvas itself. These are known as global actions, and unlike actions bound within a certain state, global actions can be invoked at any point. So here, because I'm using an app, I might want to define that I can rotate the device at any point in time. So next I select the rating button and I want to define some data. So we looked at the flow, now I want to look at the data we can map in here. So I can very simply say that I want an integer between one and five and make that a flat distribution, giving me a number between one and five evenly. But we can be more sophisticated than simply have a flat distribution of numbers we can generate. What I might want to do is define a second set of numbers for the algorithms to choose from. So rather than an even distribution from one to five, here I have two separate sets. One is one to four, and the other is just five. So this really increases the chances of a five being selected by the algorithms. And while it is best to let the algorithms within the system take the model and choose where to go next, there are some cases where we do need to narrow down that search space. So for example here, we may say that the OK button really can only be pressed once the user has set both the username and a password. We're not defining the order here, so let's just say that we need to have both of them. Now we can do that by using variables within our system. You can see that I have generated two variables for this login screen. One is the username and the other one is the password. So these will be booleans to say whether we have set these or not. But by default, when you first enter that state, we will set them to be false. So we have not yet set the username or the password. Now I select the username action within that state. And what I need to do is say that when I'm here, I set that has username variable to be true. So we are recording that we have entered something into the username. And likewise, we do the same for the password action. Now I can use those two variables to control the OK action such that it can only be executed when the value of both the username and password variables are both true, i.e. the model has executed both the username action and the password action. Now I've defined my model, I can execute it. You'll see the states gray out, and then the flow of the application run through as each action is triggered. At the end of the run, we can see, not surprisingly given our weightings, that the value of five was selected for the rating. So now we've run our model, we can look at the coverage report. This gives us a expandable tree view 
of the different states and actions we've looked at. And we can see from the rating value action that the number of five is the only one selected because we've only run this once and we know that was the value that the algorithm has picked. Now let's look at a model for a richer application. Here we're going to look at the Apple Store app. When I launch this app, then I see a home page. On the home page, there's a menu at the bottom that shows me discover, shop, account, bag. I also have a search icon at the top right hand corner. So let's start to model this application. First of all, I have my usual start state. And in my start state, I've already added a launch app action. This will launch the app for me. Now let's build a state that models this home page. We're going to call that the home screen. And I need to add some actions into that. The first action we're going to add is the discover action. Then we move on to add the shop, then account, and then bag. That covers the main actions at the bottom of the home screen. But we also have the search icon, so let's add that in. Much like the rating action in the previous example, let's do something interesting with the data for the search action. When selecting the search action, I add a new action variable, and I'm going to call this the search string. Rather than an integer, as we had in the previous example, I'm going to choose a set, which allows me to define an enumeration of different values. So for the search string, I want to be able to select an iPhone, an iPad, a watch, and TV. So now we have some of the home screen mapped. We now need to click our launch app action and then link that to the home screen. We will come back later to extending out this model, but let's look now and how we attach the snippets to particular actions. On the left hand side, there is a snippets tab. This shows you all the different snippets available within the particular eggplant functional suite associated with this model. Right clicking on a snippet attaches that snippet to the selected action. Here I've added the search task snippet to the search action. It appears then in the right hand side property window where I can see the snippets called by the action. I can pass data between the model and the snippet. Here we're using the search string variable from the model and passing that to the snippet. So the model will define what particular search string I'm looking for and the snippet will simply take that as a parameter and execute it. Now let's run the model. Because we've attached a snippet to the search action, it will invoke that snippet and we'll see it control the system under test. In this case, the Apple Store app. When the search action is selected, the model will select a value from our search string variable and then pass that to the snippet. And we'll see the snippet control the application. And here it's selected TV as the search string. And as the process repeats, different values for the search string will be selected by the model. We previously had TV, and next we have iPad. And finally, we have iPhone. So let's stop that execution and get back into adding more into our model. So let's add another state. And in this, we will look at the actions a user has within the account screen. I will rename my new state something sensible. Let's call it the account screen. And then we'll look at the app itself and see what options the user has and then select actions for those. You can see in the app itself, I have options to look at my favorites, my orders, and also my reservations.
I will link the account action in our home screen to this new account screen state. So again, the algorithms will go from the account action in the home screen to any of the actions with the account screen. And now let's add our snippets. We can look at one of the snippets. In this case, it's go to account. We can see at the bottom screen in the console the sense talk within the snippet itself. Very simple, click on the account and wait for the account title to appear. So now I select the actions within the account screen and I right click on the snippets to assign each snippet to the relevant action. So favorites, I map to my favorites, orders to my orders, and reservations to my reservations. So let's go and run this model. As before, we launch the application. We're in the home screen. It's selected account as the state to go to next. We go to the reservations. Then we're looking at orders. And then it picks favorites. So let's stop that there. We can now add further actions and states to model out the rest of the Apple Store app. Now, as we see this run, it will launch the app itself. We'll enter the main panel. Here it's selected the shop action and we'll browse through the shop pages in order for it to select a particular device from the data we've entered into the model. So here it's moved down through the flow, selected an iPhone X in silver, and the memory capacity it selected is 256 gigabytes. And you can see in this model that once a phone has been selected, the test moves to the exit state. In the exit state, we've set it such that the app itself is shut down. Now let's look at the coverage report for this richer model. This shows us a combined summary of all our test runs for this model. We can continue to explore the tree view or have the coverage report visualized as a heat map on top of our model. The dark blue areas represent high coverage and the light gray areas low coverage. Thanks so much Gareth for that demonstration. Now we're going to go to a few questions from the audience. We have a question here from a Senior Director of Application Development at ADP, and their question is, what are the AI capabilities in test planning? Yeah, I mean, there's lots um, of uh, AI capabilities uh, in test planning uh, that we've been exploring. I mean, today, there's such a huge amount of data that's relevant to testing, and you know, there's things like you know, the quality data from previous releases including you know, how many defects were found in the last release, um, you know, where uh, it's got development data, like what components have changed in this release, what complexity is it, I mean, who made the changes, how sort of reliable are those developers over time? You know, and you've got user data, you know, what journeys do real users do? Uh, what impacts do particular defects have on those journeys and so on? You know, and test planning is supposed to be about taking all this kind of information and understanding what testing is needed to maximize quality and to provide confidence. But, you know, that's pretty much impossible to do manually. Uh, it's really just too much information. And it's also too open to what you might call confirmation or, you know, selection bias. So what we're doing here with Eggplant AI is that Eggplant AI does this for you. It's about taking all this information and using machine learning and AI to determine what testing needs to be done and optimizing your testing to improve the user experience and give you confidence. Thanks so much, John. We have another question from a product manager of Connected Experiences at Keurig Green Mountain Coffee very interesting. They ask, how would you apply DAI to mobile app testing and design iteration? Yeah, I mean, in the, that world, I mean, let's tackle design iteration first. I mean, you'd build your model in uh, eggplant AI and you'd set it running continuously and it will continue to adapt the test cases that are run 
as new elements are added to the application. Um, and then the application model can be easily extended to match or can even determine the new elements to the application uh, and present them to, so that the model can be extended. So in essence, the AI model is extended incrementally as the app is updated. So your tests always match the capability. And with regard to applying that to mobile app testing, one of the unique things about digital automation intelligence is that the AI model automatically generates the tests that are then automatically run using uh, eggplant functional. And eggplant functional has the capability to take control and um, exercise user journeys just like a real user would on any mobile device you know, iOS, Android, any kind of unusual bespoke device, any kind of, you know, um, laptop or whatever, um, and even anything like a point of sale device or an electronic medical records device or a tab, you know, tablet computer or a tough book in the military field operations. Um, and so, you know, this is evolving the application model can then be automatically run and evolved um, on any any kind of mobile device. Super, John. Thank you so much for that. We have another question here from a systems integration analyst uh, at Washington Federal. They ask, what are the execution methodologies, integrations within business models, workflow management tools, status reporting capabilities and res results reporting capabilities? Pretty comprehensive question. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've got to get my head around that. So, you know, the execution methodologies, integrations, workflow, and so on. So, digital automation intelligence is all about continuous testing. Um, so, execution um, is continuous, and teams typically update their models in sprint. Um, so testing is always aligned with development. You know, you've got this continuous, continuous uh, delivery kind of cycle where where, where testing is integrated in that, and the amount of time you have to test is is ever decreasing. Um, status reporting um, can be done uh, the traditional way, you know, in terms of test cases passing or failing. But when you're running hundreds, uh, thousands of tests, this doesn't really um, necessarily work. Um, instead, you really need a more statistical approach that talks about coverage um, and identifies high risk areas. Um, and that's one of the things that eggplant AI actually does um, automatically and you know linked to eggplant analytics. Um, and finally, a key point of digital automation intelligence is that we express quality not only in technical factors such as coverage and you know pass rate of tests, but on the predicted impact. Um, on the user. So if you release now, um, you know, you would, uh, you know, you're at the level of 3.5 eggplants out of five. Um, and, you know, we predict that uh, you should be very cautious about releasing. Um, but, you know, with a little bit more testing in a particular area to improve your coverage um, and uh, some improvements to the user experience, that might be pushed to four eggplants out of five which is uh, a go for launch or you might you know have four and a half eggplants out of five which might give you sort of exceptional uh quality so it's about predicting you know what will be the net promoter score what will be you know factors like the churn or the or or the uh the impact um on on user experience Super, John. Thanks so much. We have another question from somebody else at ADP, a lead acceptance test engineer. Uh, this person asks, how would you model the user's real world of an app to generate test objectives with a focus on end-to-end -end data flows as generated by a user? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> eggplant AI models are exactly models of how a user can interact with an app. Um, and they're not models of the underlying technology, um, they're really a model of, 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 that, of that user journey. So eggplant AI actions are all things a user would do, you know, log in, search for a product, check out, et cetera. So the key um, here is that eggplant AI, um, we're using that, we don't define the sequence of actions. We can model what a user can do, not what they should do, 
Um, and this means we can test human workflows that developers you know, weren't even thinking about, but that actually real users do, um, because that's often where the bugs are. Um, you know, for example, how a user behaves in a strange circumstance or under stress, or you didn't consider that that might happen. So um, we can also take in feeds from, you know, what users are actually doing once the app goes into production uh, in terms of what we might consider shift right. So launching the app, but still testing it, analyzing whether those users are being successful and feeding that back into the testing process. So we're continuously learning, continuously testing. Super, thanks so much, John. We have a question from a software quality engineer at NCR. Uh, interesting question they ask, how would I integrate test automation in a continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline? Eggplant uh, digital automation intelligence is fully integrated into uh, the CICD pipeline. It's fully set up for continuous test and um, we've designed all aspects of it uh, to be that way. And John, is that relatively new or is that something that's been around for a while? No, that's something that's always been part of the capability, but now we've taken it to the next level um, because not only are we doing continuous uh, tests from an automation point of view in terms of you know automating test execution, but we're doing continuous um, recalculation of the very test cases. No other company um, in the industry offers true continuous testing from the point of view of the entire test pipeline from recomputing the tests to running them to analyzing the data. Some might say they've got continuous testing in terms of execution, but nobody does true continuous testing integrated into that CICD pipeline. Thanks so much, John. That was an excellent answer. Uh, now, let me turn to the next one from a senior QA engineer at a company called Desert. Um, they asked, how does DAI, DAI impact the industry and possible jobs in the future? Which is a very interesting question. Oh, it's a oh, it's a very topical question, um, and uh, you know we, we, the, the question that everybody always ponders is: Is artificial intelligence going to take our jobs? I mean, we have taken a completely different approach. We believe that digital automation intelligence transforms testing from a you know compliance cost center to a revenue generating um, you know profit center, um, and Part of that is powering the human tester to be 10 to 100 times more productive. Um, it's, it's really about getting more out of your team because you know, we need to get better coverage, better quality, quicker time to market. So it's about testing that's measurably increasing the revenue of an application so that the priority of testing will increase. Testing really, um, is big is the business function um, because you know you're betting the business on you know the software that runs it um, so in, by increasing automation of repetitive work um, we're really elevating testing to more of a consultative high value activity and I think this is the way really that AI is going to impact society it's, it's going to you know allow people to be so much more productive and it's going to help out with the more mundane aspects while allowing you to specialize on you know the domain expertise or, or or getting your job done so we have a question here from a test lead at general dynamics they ask how does my team effectively analyze all aspects of the user experience but within budget you know all aspects of the user experience will include you know the functionality the performance and responsiveness um, of the system and the usability. So is it nice to use? Does it work? And does it perform? And all of those aspects can be frustrating and in fact, you know, business losing if you get them wrong. So we all know about functional automation. That's probably the most common um, aspect. And we have very unique, um, uh, you know, approach to this um, in terms of taking control of any kind of device and using it as a user would, as well as being able to automate through APIs and the underlying objects. But performance and usability have traditionally been hard. Um, performance, um, because it requires deep knowledge of protocols, and usability, um, because it, it is somewhat subjective and what does it actually mean? Um, but we've incorporated both of these 
related aspects into digital automation intelligence. Um, and you kind of get them for free, if you like, in, in, in terms of the suite. And um, we are trying to make performance testing more accessible by making it simpler to transform your functional tests into performance tests. So Eggplant AI generates your tests and those same tests um, can be um, run from a functional aspect and then scaled up to multiple users using them at the same time, for example, um, and measuring the, the various delays and responsiveness of, of those tests. And we're also trying to make usability um, testing something that's actually measurable and you know kind of crunchy by combining things like pre-release heuristics with post-release uh, monitoring. So we're measuring, for example, things like, um, you know, is the is is the text readable? Is the are the is everything laid out in a nice way? Are the colours conforming to usability standards or corporate standards? Um, but you know, using that to predict things like user satisfaction and accessibility to those, for example, the partially cited, um, and to actually make recommendations about what to do. So combining, you know, having a single AI type model that can generate and then be used by a fusion engine or set of engines that can do all those things at once, um, and then, you know, feedback the results in analytics, the same suite, this is about within budget, you can basically get all those capabilities, if you like, at the equivalence of where you might have had to buy a myriad of different tools in the past, all from the digital automation intelligence suite. A manager from TIAA asks, how would I speed up automation along with building resilience in the automation suite? Yeah, how would I speed up automation and have resilience at the same time? Well, um, speeding up automation, I mean, we've really talked about it, you know, um, Eggplant AI auto-generating your test scripts massively, massively improves automation. So you spend a little bit of time at the beginning building out your model, but then, you know, your, your productivity curve is huge because you don't write the scripts, it does. Um, you know, and our, our technology agnostic approach also makes it, you know, much more resilient than any other system because you build a script once and it runs on all platforms. Um, so you don't have to do it, you know, n, n, um, you know, by n in terms of different platform combinations. Um, so this is incredibly, um, incredibly powerful uh, approach. And then, you know, the resilience also comes from the system can almost self-refine as uh, as the application changes over time. Uh, so you know you're on many different platforms with a, um, using the same uh, approach and uh, and a sort of self-evolving um, script. So you know huge productivity, but still with resilience. Uh, here's a question from a test manager at a leading healthcare company. They ask, and it's a common question we've seen other people ask this too: How do I make the business case to my boss for using something like DAI? Yeah, there's a number of dimensions that you can bring out to make that business case. And it's all about the um, increased um, time to market and the potential increase in revenue or, you know, beating out your competitors you can get from that. The reduced cost in terms of the number of testers you need to have on a particular project. So it enables you to do, you know, to to use those testers on a lot more things in parallel rather than having them be a bottleneck all applied to one project and it taking a long time. Um, so there's there's both cost benefits um, on the upside and the downside. And I think you can even, if they want to get more proof, you can do a proof of concept and, um, you know, that, that prove those productivity gains um, where, you know, organizations have gone back and, for example, tested uh, products that they, they where they knew the bugs were because they achieved them from the last six months of manual testing and they found them in a day. And that just shows you the kind of productivity improvements you can get. Thanks so much, John. And thank you so much to all our attendees today. We're going to be sending out a recording of this webinar very shortly. And we look forward to inviting you all to the next webinar event in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all so very much.